Well, good evening, everyone. My name is Jeff Blackadar. I'm the president of the Ottawa Horticultural Society. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Rebecca Last. Rebecca has been gardening uh, on and off since the age of eight, and she's uh, been a member of the Master Gardeners of Ottawa Carleton since 2005. Her small suburban garden is certified by the Canadian Wildlife Federation as a wildlife habitat. Rebecca grows dozens um, of heritage tomatoes, uh, dozens of varieties of heritage tomatoes every year. And this is one of the reasons why I'm looking forward to your presentation tonight, Rebecca. Um, her garden design uh, includes elements of permaculture and recently uh, she's begun experimenting with biodynamic gardening techniques. Rebecca is an award-winning gardener, including being honored by the Ottawa Horticultural Society with the Mary Bryant Award for use of, nat of use of native plants and garden design in 2014 and a Members Appreciation Award in 2015. In 2017, she was given the Ontario Horticultural Association Service Award for Meritorious Service to Horticulture. In 2018, she received an Ontario Volunteer Service Award in recognition of her 10 years of service with the Master Gardeners of Ottawa Carleton. Rebecca's gardening addiction is enabled by her loving husband, Richard, and a collection of very spoiled rescue cats. Rebecca's on the board of the Ottawa Horticultural Society, uh, and of course, uh, continues to volunteer with the Master Gardeners, and she co-chairs our program committee. Uh, Rebecca, I, I welcome you uh, to the presentation. We're looking forward to, uh, to learning more about seed starting tonight. Well, thank you, Jeff. And for most of our members, of course, this is um, a bit of a, a bit of a bonus talk tonight. Our our main event for February will be happening next Tuesday with David Ward. Um, so my talk tonight is really intended to encourage our members to think about starting some seeds so they'll have more plants they can donate um, to the Ottawa Horticultural Society uh, plant sale. And it's going to be a virtual plant sale this year that starts on May 22nd and will run through until May 25th. But you don't actually have your plants, you don't actually have to have your plants ready to hand over to the buyer until the following Saturday, the 29th of May, which is when we'll actually do the exchange of, of plants. So I hope that uh, tonight's talk does inspire you. And we're going to be talking primarily about sexual reproduction of plants. But at the end of the talk, I also wanna give you a couple of very simple tips on asexual reproduction. So let me proceed without further ado. What we're going to be talking about tonight is the difference between sexual and asexual reproduction. Um, the first interactive question we'll have, which will hopefully work, uh, will be about why you might want to start your plants from seed rather than just going out and buying them. We'll have a little bit of a vocabulary lesson um, to introduce you to some of the lexicon for seed starting. And we'll talk a little bit about the importance of documentation. I have some uh, tips on where you might get your seeds from. We'll talk about seed viability, equipment and supplies, what to start, where and when. Um, we'll talk briefly about starting outdoors and getting a head start on your outdoor seed starting, starting your seeds indoors, hardening off. And uh, if our first interactive question works well, we'll, we'll use the same technique to, do, um, to answer some questions on troubleshooting at the end of the lecture to see how well you've learned what I've been talking about. So asexual reproduction um, or propagation of plants is the kind of thing that happens when you do divisions of a mature perennial or you take cuttings, for example, um, and I'll show you a couple of examples of that. Um, air layering is another technique where you're taking a, a branch, usually from a woody plant, stripping a little bit of bark from it and laying it on the soil, usually with a a rock or a brick or something to hold it in place and just leaving it there. That can take months, it can take a year or more. Um, tissue culture, which is usually done in laboratories. All of these techniques have two characteristics in, in common. You're dealing with a single parent plant and the result of your propagation 
is a genetic clone of that parent plant. Now with sexual uh, propagation, we're talking about primarily growing from seed. And as a result, you have a mom and a dad. So your dad is called the pollen parent and your mom is the seed parent. And the result is offspring who are genetically different from the parents, but combine the traits of both. So this is what you would find in any ordinary family where you have mom and dad and, you know, the child has got dad's nose and mom's eyes and, you know, dad's chin, for example. Um, so there's a combination of traits, but the result is a unique individual. So here's our first poll question. And that is, can you think of some reasons why you might want to go to the bother of starting your plants from seed? And if you can go to the tab that Jeff indicated, um, there are some answers there. You can check off. I think Jeff, you've got it set up so you can set check as many of those answers as you think are relevant. Sorry, Rebecca. I, I this is set up to this will pick the, your best answer. Unfortunately, okay. I should have set this up as more of a uh, pick uh, pick all that apply. But uh, yeah, this will this will this will be your best your best answer. Okay, well that's fine. So <laughs> pick, pick your favorite reason for starting seeds, and we can we can talk about the results in a second. So we'll give you a what well, count of twenty or something. And I think and we uh, we also we may be delayed um, by the time. Uh, people on YouTube hear, um, actually hear us, hear our questions. So it might be that, um, what if we, if I report back on the answers in a moment, I don't, um, j just that there's a video delay with, uh, with the meeting. Fair enough. So we'll just give folks a, a few minutes. Actually, you know what, while you're doing that, I'm going to start with my, my first uh, example of asexual propagation. Um, so we're not wasting time. And I have here an extremely homely coleus. It's been under light since the fall and you can see it's gotten very leggy and it's lost a lot of its lower leaves. It's starting to get a bit woody. This is a variety called uh, green and gold. It's quite a pretty chartreuse um, leaf with a kind of creamy stripe down the middle of it, but it's not a pretty looking plant. Now we can make this a pretty looking plant and I'll show you how in one second. But for now, so we've got some answers in, that's great. Um, so we had, uh, what do you reckon we had here? Maybe how many people do you think we had answer this, Jeff? I'd say it's a, it looks like about uh, a, uh, maybe 10 or 11, 10 people I would guess. Okay, so we had about a third of our people saying that Saving money is a good reason for, um, for, say, for growing plants from seed. And that is a good reason. Growing rare and unusual varieties is another excellent reason. Um, breeding new varieties, and that's something that we can do. And yes, absolutely, it is a lot of fun to save plants from seed. So we're now gonna go back to the presentation. And these are the answers, in fact, that I had come up with. Um, now, I, I do kind of want to add a caveat around the saving money piece, because just the other day, I blew a hundred bucks on buying new tomato varieties from a local grower. Um, so I'm not sure that I'm going to be saving a lot of money, but I will certainly be growing varieties of tomatoes that I haven't had the, the chance to try before. And um, I'm looking forward to having the fun of doing that. Earning bragging rights is a really important thing too. Um, I haven't gotten into breeding new varieties, but certainly there are a number of master gardeners who do really interesting uh, breeding work. And in fact, our, our um, Ann Johnson, who's a member of the Ottawa Hort Society breeds daylilies as well, um, which is, uh, plant that lends itself quite well to breeding new varieties. I think one of the most important things for me is that we're really preserving biodiversity by growing out these varieties of seeds that uh, might be kind of rare and unusual. 
And my experience with starting perennials from seed is that the hardiness tends to be slightly better. I didn't have any luck at all with lavender until I started growing my own from seed. And the, the pieces of lavender that I grew from seed myself have now endured in my garden for a decade or more. So I think that that definitely um, indicates that they're a little bit tougher and hardier than the ones I would buy from the store. And of course, when we're buying plants from the big box stores, um, what tends to happen is that those are plants that were, they were seeded and they grew up in, often in the Niagara Peninsula area or down around, um, you know, London, Ontario, quite a bit warmer than it is here. So it makes sense that if we're growing seeds uh, for ourselves in this environment, they're going to do better in this environment. So let's talk a little bit about the vocabulary for seed starting. The first term we have is, and these are, maybe I should have done these in, in um, alphabetical order, but there was, there was kind of a logic to the way I had them organized. Viability refers to a seed's ability to sprout and begin growing. So viability is really the first thing that we want to know about our seed. Is it going to be viable? Is it going to sprout for us? Dormancy is a genetic block on germination. And if you think about what happens to perennials in our climate, we get the flowers in the spring or summer, and then the fruit develops and the seed for that plant is ready sometime in the fall. Well, if that seed drops to the ground and starts germinating immediately in the fall, it's gonna be a little baby when the winter hits and it's not gonna do that well. So mother nature has invented this concept of dormancy to allow perennial seeds in climates like ours to kind of sleep through the winter and then wake up in the spring. And for many of our um, cold tolerant perennials, we have to put them through a period of cold stratification in order to break dormancy. In other words, to overcome that block on germination. And cold stratification um, can be done a number of different ways. The, the traditional technique is to pre-soak your seeds for 24 hours at room temperature, place them in a moist medium. This could be uh, peat, sand, paper towel. Um, actually, Dorothy Toll, who starts all kinds of seeds for the, uh, the Rock Garden Society, tells me that she uses coffee filters um, as, her, as her medium. And then um, you're going to take that, that wet seed and it's in its moist little environment, and you're going to put it into a cold environment, about four degrees Celsius, which is roughly 38, 34 to 38 degrees Fahrenheit. It's about the temperature that you'd find in the, the crisper or the, the regular part of your fridge. Um, the length of time you leave it there will be determined by the specific genetics of that plant. So with many plants, um, six, you know, sort of four to six weeks is fine. I once tried growing uh, Actea from seed um, and I got as far as the, the soaking and the cold stratification and I looked it up and it said, cold stratify for six months and then warm stratify. And, and at that point I thought, oh, for heaven's sakes, and I'm afraid I gave up on it. Um, warm stratification is more often used for tropical plants. It's not something that we would typically find here, but it is, it is a technique that can be used with tropical seeds. Very similar to your cold stratification, except that you're going to be exposing those seeds to rather than a cold uh, period, you're going to be exposing them to temperatures between 80, 18 and 25 degrees Celsius or 65 to 80 degrees Fahrenheit. And again, for a period that's determined by the specific genetics of that plant. And if you're starting a new kind of seed that you haven't grown before, and you're not comfortable with the instructions that you see on the seed package, your best bet is to go online and ask Mrs. Google. She knows all the answers. Now, our last term here reminds me of those um, sort of cultural pieces in National Geographic where you had 
wonderful people from from Africa with their tribal dress and and the scars that they would they would decorate their face and their body with. Scarification is in fact a process of helping the seed to germinate by lightly sanding or abrading the surface of a hard shelled seed. You don't need to do this with many seeds, but with things like, oh, morning glory seeds, for example. If you were to start those, um, they have a very, very hard shell on them and just lightly sandpapering them will give them a bit of a head start. Now, documentation is something that I think is absolutely crucial. Whenever I buy a package of seeds, the first thing I do is I write on that package the date, not the date, but the year that I bought it. So, you know, the seeds that I got the other day, I, when I get them out of the envelope, I'm going to be writing on them 2021 so that when I come across those seeds in some future time, I'll know how old they are. And that helps me to determine whether or not those seeds are still going to be viable. Now, the um, uh, labels are a, a very important thing, particularly if you're doing what I do, which is to grow multiple varieties of tomatoes. Believe me, telling the difference between, um, you know, a, a beefsteak tomato and a cherry tomato when they're seedlings this high, if you don't have labels on them, you're just not going to know. Um, it's also helpful to note the date on which you sowed those seeds so that you can tell whether or not they're germinating. Um, and if you know that they're supposed to take, you know, five to seven days in the case of tomato seeds to germinate, and you're 10 days into the process and there's no sign of life, uh, you might wanna try reseeding. You might wanna try applying a little bit of bottom heat, um, praying perhaps. You know, that these are <laughs> these are things that you won't know unless you've done your documentation. And in particular, if you're sowing outside, and I can't tell you how many times I've done this, where I sowed something in the fall, and then the following spring, I'm doing my cleanup, I hadn't properly marked the location, and I just merrily rip up all those poor little seedlings that I started the fall, the previous fall. Taking photographs is a great way of doing your documentation. Um, it also helps to monitor your failures and your successes so that you, uh, you know where you need to do your research or where you might wanna just give up and try a different kind of seed the next year. Um, and also, as we talked about it, it lets you know how long it took a particular variety to germinate. I've had seeds where the package says, you know, germinates in five to seven days and 10 days later, I see my first sprout. Well, you know, if I make a note of that on the seed package, then I know the next time I'm using those seeds that I don't need to worry after seven days. They're just a little slow. Um, it's also, I find helpful to note where I got my seeds from. And I, I do take note because I buy from a lot of different vendors. Over the years, I found that some will have a higher germination rate than others. And finally, if you're growing your vegetables outdoors, keeping a chart from one year to the next. So you know that you had your tomatoes in this bed this year, next year, you're going to want to move them over um, to a different location so that you're not creating an environment where you're growing the same thing year after year in the same place, drawing all the same nutrients out of the soil and not replenishing them and creating an environment where the pests know exactly where to go to get their favorite snack food. So some of our seed sources, and we're a little bit challenged um, this year as we were last year, because of course the um, uh, major, the main event for, for me buying seeds is a local Seedy Saturday event. Those can't be held in person, but there are virtual CD Saturdays being organized. And if you're familiar with the Seeds of Diversity website, you can go onto that, onto that website and find events and find the virtual CD Saturdays that are close to you. Major seed suppliers include companies like uh, McKenzie, for example. 
Um, walk into any hardware store at this time of year, your local Home Depot or Canadian, heart, uh, Canadian Tire, you're going to find a rack of seeds, usually somewhere close to the cash, because for some reason people think of seeds as being a, an impulse buy. So, you know, they sell it along with the candies before you leave the store. Um, and that's actually not a bad place to buy seeds. The things to watch for if you are buying from these um, hardware stores and so forth and, and getting the major seed suppliers, try and avoid the hybridized seeds that you won't be able to save. Um, and try to make sure that you can see a date on the package of the seed. Because sometimes, particularly if you're shopping about now, you might actually be getting seeds that have been hanging around since not last year, but the year before last. There are a number of catalogs that you can get, Vessies, Richies, um, uh, uh, Johnny Appleseed, I think is another one. I, I found a, an American vendor called Renee's Seeds who has some wonderful heritage varieties. A lot of the local growers, a lot of the folks that we meet at the farmer's market who are selling us fruits and vegetables during the season have also taken to selling seeds. Um, and it's for those local growers, it's, uh, pardon the pun, it's a little bit of seed money at the, at the start of their growing season. And so if you've enjoyed a particular kind of, of squash or tomato, that you got from a local grower at a farmer's market, it's worth inquiring to see if that vendor actually also sells seeds and might have seeds for the variety that you really enjoyed. And I've also found that talking to the growers at the farmer's market, um, most of them are very, very generous with their advice. So, you know, if you, if you buy seeds from them and have problems, you can talk to them later on in the season and get them to answer a few questions for you. Ottawa's got a couple of seed libraries. Uh, Just Food Ottawa has a food seed library, um, which is well worth checking out. And I recently found out we have a wildflower seed library in Ottawa as well. Now the idea behind a seed library, kind of like a lending library for books, is that you withdraw your seeds in the spring, you grow the plants out, and then you return a portion of your seed in the fall. And what this means is that that seed is being used, it's being kept fresh, and somebody else can borrow them again next year. Of course, you can save your own seeds. A number of horticultural societies, um, and I find the rock garden societies are particularly good for this. NARGS is the North American Rock Garden Society. They do an international seed exchange every year. So if you're a member of a group like Overgs, the Ottawa Valley, Rock Garden and Horticultural Society. Always have to take a breath in the middle of that name. It's got to be the longest name out there. Um, you could take part in, in their seed exchanges, which I say, as I say, are right across North America. Now for gardeners, you may have had friends, neighbors, or family who've come back from trips and said, oh, I brought you a souvenir. Here's a package of seeds. Um, in fact, one of, one of the more exciting gifts that I received was seeds for a queen protea that my sister-in-law brought back from South Africa. They're the neatest looking seeds. They look like little black flies. I never did get them to germinate, but boy, it was exciting to get that package of seeds. Um, I've had some interesting experiences with things kind of growing spontaneously out of a, a bouquet of wildflowers that I, that I brought home. Um, at one point, in fact, my darling husband brought me a bouquet of flowers that had some pussy willows in it. When I composted the bouquet, didn't think anything of it. A year or so later, I noticed this sprout growing out of where the compost bin had been. And lo and behold, it turned into a pussy willow tree. Um, I've also had uh, blueweed, which is... Um, it's not a native plant. It's one you see quite often along the side of the highways in um, uh, usually July or early August. And um, that's one that I had picked, brought it home, composted the bouquet after it was finished. And lo and behold, I ended up having blueweed in my garden for several years after that. And that was okay. It's quite a pretty plant. I can't grow delphinium. So blueweed was my... Um, 
my poor man's version of delphiniums. Now I mentioned birdseed mixes primarily because these can be tricky. Um, you actually want to be a little bit careful about your birdseed mix because they can be a source of invasive plants. So it's not, it's a source of seed, but it's not necessarily a source of seed that you want to grow. So we know we've, when we bought our seeds, because we've, we've put the date on it. So let's talk about how long those seeds are going to remain viable. How long will we be able to keep them before um, they lose the ability to, to germinate and sprout for us? There is a kind of gen very general rule of thumb here that the bigger the seed, the longer it will store because it's got more germplasm. Um, which is kind of like the albumin or the, the uh, egg white in an egg. It's what the, the seed feeds off of. However, in the case of very oily seeds, the castor bean plant is one example. Another example, which has become um, quite uh, um, dramatic is the butternut uh, tree seed. Um, these are very oily seeds and they don't store because the oil goes rancid. Uh, the reason this is an issue with butternuts is that butternut trees, which are a native species, are under threat from a very nasty canker disease, um, which is really wiping them out. And we have yet to figure out a way to save those butternut seeds so that we can actually study the issue of the canker and hopefully preserve a few trees. Short-lived seeds will last one or two years. I find it's definitely worthwhile buying my, um, my squash, melon, cucumber, all the cucurbits, they tend to have relatively short life, life spans. Lettuce also, little tiny seed uh, that doesn't last particularly well. Um, parsley's not bad. Parsnips actually, which should be on this list, parsnip seed needs to be fresh. It, for whatever reason, it's the same family, but it just doesn't last as well as the carrot seed, even though it's actually a bigger seed. So it's a weird one. Uh, peas, beans, um, and spinach also will last two to three years. Now, these are, um, this is presuming you have good storage conditions. And good storage conditions mean you're keeping your seeds at a cooler temperature in a dry, dark environment. I actually have, some people have a beer fridge in the basement. I have a seed fridge. Yes, I am a seedaholic, sorry. Um, and so I actually keep my seeds in a plastic Ziploc or a jar in the seed fridge in the basement. The reason they're in a sealed container is that although the temperature is right and the darkness is there when the fridge door is closed, the fridge is actually a little too humid. So keeping the seeds in a sealed container allows them to last a little bit longer. And then things like beets, cabbage, tomatoes, eggplants, peppers. I've planted these seeds um, when they're five and six years old. Your germination rate might be a little bit lower, but you're still gonna get plants as a result. They, they do store well. Here's a fun little slide. Um, this is a picture of the Judean date palm tree. Now, the story behind this date palm is that um, it was, sorry, I'm missing my notes here. It was discovered in an archeological dig and it was assumed to be inviable because it was at least 2000 years old. Uh, and then the people who'd found it simply threw it in a drawer and it sat in a drawer in some academic's office for another decade or so until a keen young grad student came across it and said, hmm, I wonder if I can get it to sprout. Well, lo and behold, this 2000 year old date seed did sprout. Um, I don't think you can actually see the name, but appropriately enough, it, it's called Methuselah. Uh, this picture um, dates from about the around 2010 and I read a follow-up article recently apparently these this particular variety of, of date palm um, was basically wiped out by the Romans in the in the wake of um, the crucifixion they there was a Jewish uprising the Romans came in and they 
um, created the first diaspora for the Jews, sort of spread them to the four winds, and they destroyed most of these date palms, and they were in fact extinct. Um, but it turns out they're also dioecious. So Methuselah, all by himself, wasn't able pr to produce fruit. However, they were successful in sprouting several more, and this species has now been literally resurrected from the dead. So it just goes to show you, if you think your seeds might not be viable, it's worth giving it a shot. You never know. Life will find a way. Now let's talk about what kinds of equipment you're going to need for your seed starting. Um, the essential supplies are clean and I would say sterile potting soil. Now, I once um, thought to myself, well, wouldn't it be nice to have organic potting soil? And I actually spent extra money on it, brought it home potted my seeds up, and lo and behold, I had a little infestation of uh, fungus gnats um, because that soil was not sterile. So I'm all in favor of organics, but when it comes to potting soil, go with the sterile stuff. There is actually a variety of, um, if, you, if you're buying bagged soil, you can just use potting soil. I did for years and years and years, works fine. Uh, but you can also buy a seed starting soil. The main distinction between that and regular potting soil is it has a little bit more peat moss in it. So it's a little bit lighter, fluffier texture and it will hold water a little bit more. You need a light source. You need something that is going to generate light, whether it's a south facing or a west facing windowsill or you use um, artificial lights. I do like the artificial lights. Labels are very important as we talked about. And the fertilizer is optional. Now you're also going to need some pots to put your seeds in, a waterproof tray of some kind so that, um, and I, I always recommend bottom watering. I'll explain why in a little while. Um, but regardless of whether you water from the top or the bottom, the water comes out the bottom and you wanna have something to catch it. A light stand is definitely helpful and an oscillating fan, to my mind, is an essential piece of equipment in your seed starting. And finally, um, I find for a lot of seeds, particularly the ones that need moisture to germinate, it's very helpful to have a plastic cover. Some of the things that are nice to have but not essential, um, perlite or vermiculite to make your potting soil a little bit lighter texture. Ziploc baggies, which can be used to store those um, seeds that where you're doing a trial germination or you're, um, uh, you're, doing, you're putting them through their cold or their warm stratification. I actually have a, a timer on my lights, um, which saves a lot of electricity and a lot of hassles with, with, um, with my darling hubby who keeps an eye on these things. Um, so the lights come on automatically at six in the morning and they go off automatically at about uh, 9.30 or 10 o'clock at night. 16 hours is how much light I'm giving them every day. A heating mat is not something I would necessarily recommend. I've probably grown, I would say, 80 or 90 different varieties of tomatoes over the years. I've only ever found one variety that required bottom heat to germinate. And we talked about the small bar fridge I have for keeping my, uh, my seeds in the basement. And in a minute, we'll talk about the difference between a cold frame or a warm frame. You probably don't wanna have a warm frame in an urban context, um, but a cold frame is a useful thing to have. And these are some examples of seed starting setups. So um, these are, on either side here, we have pictures of seeds that are just sitting on windowsills, getting natural light. The only thing to watch with that is that when you have your seeds on a windowsill, they're going to vary, the little seedlings are going to very gradually lean towards the light. So you want to take them and turn them about 90 degrees every day so that they grow up nice and straight. What's missing from this list? There's one thing I didn't mention that I should have. And maybe somebody can put in the comments what they think is missing. 
You see anything in the comments there, Jeff? Yeah, not not just yet. And I'm I'm thinking carefully of what's missing. Um, so we'll see if uh, we'll see if something comes in. I'm intrigued. I, I'm thinking of what's required here. So the answer is I didn't mention seeds. That that is yeah th that. <laughs> <laughs> it's hilarious. So I, so we have some some thing. We've got labels, possibly. Yeah. Um, so I did mention labels and plant. Yeah. Oh, marketing. labels. There they are. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, oh, I, and I now yes, seeds. and you'll. Rebecca, you'll be glad to hear um, the many responses now coming in saying seeds. There you go. Okay. Oh, this is great. I think we anticipating a, you, <laughs> anticipating your answer, this is wonderful. We have a very observant bunch of, of yeah. folks online, which is great. Okay. So let's talk about what kinds of seeds we're going to start, where and when. Now, our warm season veggies include things like tomatoes, peppers, eggplant, our squash and our melons. These are ones that we need to start, um, or we, we don't want to plant out before the last frost day. They, they're very, they're very um, cold sensitive. So if we are starting them indoors um, for tomatoes, peppers, eggplants and so forth, our starting date is going to be late March, either the last week of March or the first week of April. And that means that your little seedlings are going to be about six to eight weeks old at the point when you can start to transplant them out. So they're going to be a good enough size that they can stand up on their own two roots um, and do just fine outside. And these are seeds that you will start indoors. The easy annuals are things like cosmos, marigolds, nasturtiums. Um, what else have I grown? Um, I grew some scabiosa last year, which was a fairly easy one, sweet peas. Uh, these also can be started indoors um, or you can sow them directly outside. I find, uh, for example, the annual poppies work just fine sown directly outside after all danger of frost has passed. Now our cool season veggies can be started as soon as the soil can be worked. So you can start them outside directly seeding into the soil, or you can put them in a cold frame to give them a little bit of a head start. And I'll have some pictures of what a cold frame looks like. And then we have our trickier perennials. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about some of those. So one of the things we can do is we can winter sow. This is a technique that works very, very well with plants that have that hard shell we talked about in the context of scarification, because putting plants outside, sowing them in a container outside and leaving them out there for the winter means that they're going to go through a natural period of cold stratification. And they're also gonna go through the freeze thaw cycle that we have every, every late winter and spring. And that is what cracks the seed and triggers germination. You can also um, do the calculations and I'll show you how in a second and start these uh, seeds indoors under lights or on a south facing windowsill. Now I mentioned squash and melons and zucchinis and things of that kind. My experience with these has been that, yes, you can start them early inside. However, by the time they have gone through the transplant shock, you're just as well to start them outside from seed as soon as the soil is warm. And in my garden, um, everyone else in Ottawa is in a zone 5A. I'm in a zone 4B because I'm on the north side of a hill. So I wait until June 1st uh, before I sow these seeds out and I still get mature plants. They do still work. 
So this is an example of a native plant, nat lovely native species actually. It's a little bit complicated because it does require that period of stratification, cold stratification. So let's talk about when we're gonna start it. Let's assume that we wanna have this little seedling ready for our May 29th um, exchange date. So we'll say May 24th, cause then it'll, we can take a photo of it and put it on, advertise it on the, uh, for the plant sale. We know we need 30 days of cold striation for this puppy. So May 24th minus 30 days gives us April 24th. We'll need about 10 to 15 days to germinate. So let's take the maximum, we'll say 15 days. That brings us down to April 9th. And we need about 30 days for this little guy to get big enough that we can transplant him out. So 30 days from April 9th brings us back to March 9th. And that's when we're going to start our seeds for this particular variety. So you can see it's, it's very simple mathematics, um, but it does require knowing, do you need a cold stratification period and how long? How long is your germination going to take? And how fast is this little guy going to grow to a point where it can be transplanted? And pretty much all of that information is going to be available to you with a few web searches on the specific variety that you want to start. So let's talk at, look at some of our uh, outdoor starting techniques. Cold frames is something that most people will be familiar with. This is an illustration of a cold frame here. Typically, it has a slanted glass covered roof that you would orient towards the south or the southwest. So it catches the maximum amount of light and it will get very hot in there. So you want some form of ventilation. Um, good old Lee Valley, of course, will sell you all the tools that you'll ever possibly need. And one of the fancy things they have is a heat activated little um, pneumatic opening device. So you can build your cold frame, install this little device, and when it gets too hot, it'll pop the lid open to give a little bit of air so your poor little seedlings don't actually fry. Now, a warm frame is a really interesting technique that dates back to before we had electricity. In fact, I was first introduced to the concept of a warm frame by one of the gardeners at... Um, um, Oh my God, I just had a complete blank there. Um, it's the historical village down on the St. Lawrence Seaway. Um, so the idea behind this, and the reason why you might not want to do it in an urban garden, is that you're building a box like a cold frame but the bottom of your box is lined with manure and straw. And we're talking fresh manure here. We're not talking the stuff that's been nicely aged so you can put it on the garden. You want the fresh stuff because it's microbially very active and those microbes generate heat. You then layer um, soil, five or six inches of soil at least on top of your fresh manure and you're going to surround your cold, your sorry, your warm frame with straw to insulate it. So the manure at the bottom is generating heat, is providing bottom heat to warm the soil above it and allow those little seeds to germinate. Now a hot box is kind of like the 20th century or 21st century version of our warm frame, but of course we're relying on electricity you want to be very careful about building something like this for yourself. It's not something I would attempt because frankly, the combination of electricity and the water that you're using to irrigate your garden could create some challenges. Um, but if you have somebody in the family who's handy and who likes tinkering with things, there are designs online that you can use um, to, uh, to build yourself a warm frame. And um, some of the more successful gardeners swear by these things and start all of their plants in them in the basement and then move them outside. Now, this is um, the grow up that I set up that I used to have on, on the desk that I'm speaking to you from. 
Um, and it's, it's a large-ish desk, but uh, I would be able to start uh, upwards of 600 tomato seedlings in a relatively small space. So you can see that I've got labels on all my seedlings. And you can see that the lights here are just an inch or two above the, top, the tallest plant that I have. Now, typically your, um, your grow lights need to provide a full spectrum of light. You can pay quite a lot of money for the full spectrum fluorescent tubes, or you can buy one warm and one cool and get the same effect for slightly less money. I will be exper experimenting this year for the first time with the new LED lights. And I'm actually quite exciting, excited about that. Um, it's become a necessity because um, one of my old rows of fluorescent tubes has kind of given up the ghost. Um, but the exciting thing about the LEDs, first of all, they use very little power. And secondly, you can actually fine tune them to get exactly the spectrum of light that your seedlings are going to most appreciate. Now, what is that exact spectrum of light? Well, that's where science is still catching up to the technology. Um, if you live near Manatic, you may have uh, noticed the, um, I believe it's Sun, Sun Ripe, Sun Rich Greenhouse. Sun, yeah. Sun Tech? Sun Tech, thank you. Okay, you're welcome. Sun Tech Greenhouse down near Manatic. Um, and it's really cool to drive past that at night. It's like driving past a UFO because it's got this kind of pale mauve glow to it. And what they found at, at SunTech, which I think is just fascinating, they grow primarily tomatoes there for the local restaurant trade. And they grow a bunch of different types of tomatoes ranging from you know, the little cherry or grape tomatoes up to the beefsteak ones. Well, that lavender light that you can see as you drive past at night works beautifully for the cherry tomatoes. It doesn't work for the beefsteak tomatoes. Isn't that fascinating? Same species, just a different cultivar, a different variety, but it needs a different kind of light. So if you're unsure and you can't find the research, which wouldn't surprise me, then what I suggest is just aim for the full spectrum light. And that's again, a combination of warm and cool light. So typically what, what happens is that your blue green light spectrum promotes leafy growth and the red yellow, the warm light spectrum promotes flowering and fruiting. And you need both, especially if you're growing vegetables. Sorry, I probably moved on a little too fast here because I didn't explain that this is an oscillating fan. And this is an essential part. In my humble opinion, if you're growing a lot of seedlings, and you can see I have quite a few packed into a very small space here, that oscillating fan does a number of things. It makes sure that the plants are living in an environment where they have good air circulation. And one of your worst enemies as a seed starter is a fungal disease called damping off. You go down this morning and you look at your little seedlings and you water them and you make sure that they're all happy and everybody's happy and perky and standing up straight. The next day you go down and somebody's just toppled right over. And it's a fungal disease that attacks the plant at soil level. If you look closely at that little toppled over seedling, you'll see that its stem is discolored, brownish or blackish color, and it's gone all mushy. And that's because it didn't get good air circulation. My oscillating fan is going to help take care of that. Making sure that I'm not watering too much will also take care of that problem. But the oscillating fan is doing something else that's really interesting. As it moves over the plants, my little plants are constantly vibrating like that. And that constant vibration strengthens the stem so that when we move them outside, where there's always going to be some kind of air movement, they're going to be healthier and happier than they would be if they were growing up in an environment where the air is still as it normally is inside the house. Now, a couple of other things to note, I mentioned we had the bottom tray um, to catch any drips and I do bottom water. And the reason I do that is that if you imagine you have your, your pot of soil and you've spread your seeds and typically you're going to cover your seeds to a depth that is twice the depth of the seed. Well, think how tiny a tomato seed is. 
it's very tiny. You're putting about an eighth of an inch of soil on top of that. So when you go to water, even the most gentle watering, you're displacing the soil, you're displacing the seeds, and heaven forbid you should overwater a little bit and that soil actually flows out of the sides of the pot. Um, the best scenario is that you have a bald spot in the middle of your pot and all the seedlings around the outside. But what's more likely to happen is simply that your seeds will just flow over the edge of the pot and you've lost them and nothing will, nothing will grow because there's no seeds left in there. Bottom watering avoids that problem. You can see actually the lid here of a little bottle of liquid fertilizer. Um, do not apply fertilizer until your seeds have produced the first true leaves at a minimum. And in general, you shouldn't really need to fertilize at all. I sometimes will give my plants a little bit of a shot in the last week or two before I start to move them outside. Um, the one thing that's not actually shown here is a spray bottle. And I do find that spray bottles are quite helpful for just misting the surface of the soil. Particularly if you're dealing with very, very dry potting soil, it can actually be hydrostatic and it, um, or hydrophobic, and it, it will repel the water. So if you mist very gently to start off with, and then you bottom water, you get better osmosis and the, um, the water in the tray underneath will rise up to irrigate the full uh, depth of the pot. So we now have um, the question of hardening off. And the books on this were obviously written by people who didn't work full time, um, which I still do for at least a few more weeks. Um, so what they used to say was that, you know, you want to take your plants outside uh, on a nice warm day in the middle of the day and you put them in a sheltered location out of the sun, out of the wind, and you're going to leave them there for an hour or so. And then you bring them back in and you do that every day and you extend the period of time that you, what a nuisance, right? What a pain. Who's got time for that kind of nonsense? But it, hardening off is absolutely essential because if you don't harden them off, your plants, just like somebody like me who's got fair hair and freckles, when I go out in the sun for the first time after the winter, if I'm not really careful, I'm gonna turn bright red. Well, my plants aren't gonna turn bright red, but what happens is they do get sunburned and the sunburn actually wipes out patches of, of chlorophyll so that you get these white patches on the leaves of your plants. So how do you prevent that without going through the nonsense of, you know, two or three hours every day, getting longer and longer periods and so on? Well, this is my solution. This is a gazebo in the backyard and you can see it's draped with, um, I've actually turned it, this was from um, spring of 2019, which was a very cold, wet spring and, you know, honest to goodness, it felt like it was just never going to warm up. We were still getting frosts well into May. So what I did was I took our gazebo, I wrapped it in ground sheets. Uh, the white cloth over here is actually a shade cloth that is on the, um, the southeast corner. So it gets less light and less wind. And on, I used the ground sheet on the areas of, of on the sides where it was more likely to get full sun and wind. And if we go inside there, this is what it looked like inside. So I not only had all my seedlings in there, but all the house plants that go outside for a summer vacation were also hardening off out there. And this longleaf ficus in particular, it doesn't lose its leaves. So if they get sun scald, if they get burnt from being exposed to too much sun too quickly, I'm going to be looking at those ugly burnt leaves for several years before they finally drop off. But this just allowed my, my little indoor seed plants and my house plants to acclimatize to the colder temperatures outside and to the brighter light. Because what happens is anything that you're growing indoors, even if it's right next to a south facing window, 
it's getting less than half of the of the lumens of the amount of illumination that it would get on the other side of that window if it's getting full sun. So that's the importance of, of hardening off. Um, before we go to our troubleshooting slide, I, I do have to mention a couple of other things that could be problems. One is if your lights are not bright enough. And this can happen even if you're growing under fluorescent tubes. Um, if your tubes are older, you might find that your seedlings start to get a little bit leggy. And that's an indication that they're not getting enough sunlight. They're not getting enough light. Uh, it can happen if you're growing in a north or an east facing window, um, because again, they're not getting quite enough light. Another thing that you might see, and in particular, if you're using your fertilizer too much, you might see a bit of a white bloom developing on the surface of the soil. That can be mineral salts, and it could be an indication that either you have too much fertilizer, um, in which case you definitely want to ease up on the fertilizer, or it could be an indication that you um, your, your water is, is, has too many minerals in it. Um, I think the Ottawa area water is certainly not as hard as Kingston water, but it's, it's sort of hard. Uh, one thing you can do is to allow your irrigation water to sit for 24 hours before you use it, and that will allow any chlorine in the water to evaporate. I actually use um, a water saving technique. My, my grow up now isn't up here in my study. I have a special little area in the basement just outside the laundry room and my furnace drains into the laundry room sink. So I'm getting the condensate um, from the furnace and I collect that in a watering can and it's almost distilled water. So it's quite a bit less, um, has fewer minerals and so forth. And, and that means I'm less likely to get that mineral bloom on the, on the surface of the soil. We already talked about the problem of fungus gnats, uh, which I experienced when I splurged and bought myself organic potting soil. Uh, you can get fungus gnats even in sterile potting soil. If you have them elsewhere in the house, they are teeny tiny little bugs um, and the easy way to get rid of them is to simply ease up on your irrigation. Don't water as much and make sure that you let the soil dry out between waterings and that will effectively take care of your fungus gnats. Now, if you get other types of bugs like aphids, you're going to start to see symptoms like the leaves on your seedlings curling. And that can be a real problem um, it definitely helps if you're growing in an environment where you don't have any other house plants, you don't have anything else that might be um, bringing contaminants in. I had a real problem one year. Um, we actually, the year that my mom passed away, we had bought a whole bunch of uh, potted um, daffodils and tulips for the, her celebration of life. And, you know, being a gardener, of course, I couldn't just throw them out. I had to bring them home. And along with the potted tulips and daffodils, I brought home a collection of aphids who ended up infesting my seedlings that year. Uh, so the soap and water spray will take care of them, but it's a nuisance. And it's much better if you can just keep your seedlings segregated from any other source of contamination. And that applies, especially if you're bringing new plants into the house after you've started your seeds. So we're going to have another go here at um, our interactive question. And um, our, this is a, a little quiz designed to see how much attention you were paying. So our first question is, um, well, the, the questions overall are, what's wrong with this plant? So in this case, what happens is our perfectly healthy seedling has simply fallen over and died. What happened? What went wrong? And if you go to that uh, tab that Jeff indicated for you earlier, you'll be able to provide an answer. 
So I tell you what, while we're waiting for people to answer that question, I'm gonna to return to our extremely homely coleus. And we're gonna perform a little bit of surgery on this guy. So here we have a long stem with just a couple of leaves up at the top. I'm gonna to snip that right off. And you can see, I hope, that there are several nodes all along the length of that stem. Now, just plopping that into a, a jar of water, we're gonna leave it there for um, a few weeks and we will start to see, okay, let's see now. Oh, I didn't mean to interrupt Rebecca, sorry. I just wanted to get the responses up, but I, I want to also hear, hear about the coleus too. <laughs> okay, we'll go back to the coleus. Okay, good. Well, this is really good. So most people guessed that the problem with our seedlings falling over and dying was the uh, an issue of damping off. And the solution is to reduce watering and install an oscillating fan to make sure that we have good air circulation. All right, our next question is, we have slow or no germination. So what happened? What happened with the no germination or really slow germination? And while you're thinking about and answering that question, we're gonna take another snip from our coleus. This particular sprout here has a little flower at the top. Now, because we want our sprout to put its efforts into growing leaves and roots, we're gonna take that flower right off of there. In fact, it's good practice with coleus to try and pinch off any flower buds that emerge because you really are growing these guys for the leaves and not for the flowers. And particularly when you're starting a new, a new baby, and we'll put him in, in the jar with the other one. So we've got, we've got two little plants now um and we'll keep doing that here's a now this one here i think i'm going to give it a pass and the reason why is we've got a little bit of scorching on that leaf there so you don't want to be doing this with plants that might be unhealthy and for that reason i'm going to discard this stem i'm not going to try and create a new plant with it So old seed or incorrect seeding, failure to read the package directions. Well done. My goodness, we've got some real stars here. That's very well done. That is the answer to why we would have slow or no germination. What about really leggy seedlings? They're getting all kind of long. They're starting to look like my poor homely coleus, all stem and no leaf. What would be causing that? Have another little stem to put in there. And let's see, I think we've got one more we can take. So this one. So what we've done with our poor homely coleus is we've taken one plant and we've now got four new ones that we're going to set in water. It'll take about a week to 10 days for them to form roots. And during that time, we're just gonna watch the level of the water because it will go down both through evaporation and through the plants sucking it up. And we wanna make sure that um, the water level remains high enough to keep those stems covered and to make sure that any roots that sprout are going to stay happy. And then in a week or 10 days time, we'll be able to pot them up. And well done. Everybody guessed that our leggy seedlings are due to too little light. Very well done indeed. Next question. All of my plants are leaning to one side. So what went wrong there? What happened to those seedlings? 
While we're talking about that, I'm going to show you one of my favorite seed starting devices. You might recognize this as something that you would get cookies or sushi, or this is what's called a clamshell container. It has a black plastic base and it has a clear plastic top. And guess what? This is a really cool little mini greenhouse. All I need to do is cut a few holes in the bottom, put my soil into the bottom and seed in here. Now there's not a lot of depth here. So um, it works well for starting seeds and I use it particularly for seeds that need to be kept moist, such as lettuce, for example. Uh, your lettuce seeds will not germinate if they dry out, but using a clamshell like this, we create a nice moist environment. And as soon as they germinate, I can transplant them out, either out into the garden if it's, if it's warm enough. Um, and lettuce is a cold season plant, so it'll, it'll tolerate quite a bit of cool. It'll even tolerate a light frost, or I can put them into pots. And actually a really fun idea that I used to do for my mom um, was to create a planter with a bunch of different varieties of lettuce in it so that she could kind of snip and clip and, and have a, a homegrown salad from one pot. So that's a fun idea to try uh, if you have lots of different varieties of lettuce left over. How are we doing with our answers there, Jeff? Do we, uh, do we know what happened with those seedlings leaning to one side? I Failure so. to rotate. Very well done. Um, it's a little different from the two little light question, but most of, our, most of our listeners got the right answer, so well done. So we, we, uh, we planted our seeds and they came up and lo and behold, it turns out it's like we grew cuckoos. Um, those seeds that we planted did not turn out as we expected. So what happened there? And while you're thinking about and answering that question, I'm going to go and uh, bring out my, my other homely plant. Um, this is actually a really nice geranium, but you can see it's doing what geraniums tend to do in the winter. It's gotten some woody bits down at the bottom and it's gotten a little bit leggy. So in this case, what we're going to do is we're going to snip off and we wanna make sure that we get the green bits. So here's a nice juicy green bit. We're not cutting into the, into the woody brown bit here because this will not sprout nicely for us. But this nice little sprout here is actually going to do very, very well. Some people will tell you that what they do is they allow it to dry and callus over a little bit. You can do that. I don't find it makes any difference at all. Um, some people will also tell you that they use a bit of rooting hormone. I've done it with or without. Uh, you can get rooting hormone from your local nursery supply. It's not necessary. All we're gonna do with this guy at this point, I could put him into a fresh pot of soil, but I didn't prepare one. So, I just stuck him right in there next to the daddy plant. And because I don't like this ugly woody looking thing, I'm gonna just snip that right off. Out it goes. And so I have a new little geranium seedling or new little geranium plant that's a clone of mommy and daddy or mommy. And um, it will come up and it will produce new leaves for me. And I can do this for the whole plant and just keep snipping away until I get rid of all the woody stuff. This is um, this variegated variety of geranium is, called, is from the brocade series. Um, it's a very attractive leaf as you can see, but it does have a tendency to get a little bit leggy and kind of shoot up. And you can, you can see um, this stem here Again, it's quite a long stem with not a lot of leaves on it. So that would be another good candidate for, for snipping and restarting at soil level. So let's do that with that guy. And in this case, we're actually gonna remove the lowest leaf 
And we'll take off this big leaf here too, because there's a little baby next to it. And we can put those into the soil. And those cuttings will do very, very nicely. Um, they, geraniums don't form leaves especially quickly, uh, but they will, they will eventually, sorry, they don't form roots especially quickly, but they will eventually form roots and take over. Um, and so I've now created two little geranium clones that I can take out of this pot and transplant into another pot and make available for our sale in May. <laughs> And if you're wondering why we're making such a fuss about that sale in May, it's one of the principal revenue earners for the society. So why did our seedling not look the way we expected? Well, um, we didn't label it properly or the seed was incorrectly identified. And I have had this happen where um, I had bought uh, squash seeds um, from uh, one of the... Uh, one of the local suppliers at a CD Saturday event. And I was kind of surprised by the look of the seeds when I planted them. They didn't look quite like a squash seed ought to look. And lo and behold, it turned out that they were a variety of bean seed. So sometimes it's the <laughs> grower's fault, sometimes it's the vendor's fault, um, but it doesn't matter. The bottom line is your documentation will help you with this. Now, what about that white powder on the surface of the soil? what might cause having a kind of bloom of white powder on the surface of the soil. You seeing our answers coming in yet, Jeff? I think they are coming in. Let me, uh, I'll just bring them up one, one moment. Too Luckily, much fertilizer yeah. or too many minerals in the water. Very well done. Well, well done folks. I think you've, you've learned your lessons well. So we're going to go back to our um, presentation and just finish that off. And I think we're at the last slide at this point. So I'm ready to answer any other questions that you might have at this point. And I'm gonna ask our, our long suffering moderator to help me with this because I am not actually able to see the questions that have been posed on the YouTube. Rebecca, we, we had it. Um, and I, I know uh, catchable uh, um, come on to some questions too, but we did have a question um, from email and uh, the question was, what overnight temperatures do you wait for before your seedlings and tropical plants go outside to harden off in your tarped structure? Yeah, that was a tricky one in 2019 because it was regularly going down to zero every night. Um, so I was looking for it not to frost. And that was, that was kind of my base consideration um, the structure that you saw actually would get quite warm during the day. And um, I was taking a little bit of a risk. I, I don't know if you could see there was actually a begonia and a few other fairly tender things in there. Um, the ones that I was a little bit concerned about, uh, I would try to keep them off, off of the, um, uh, the, the, the paving stones so that um, the air could circulate around them. Um, and they wouldn't be right at ground level where the frost could creep into them. So as long as, you know, in that situation, I was just waiting for it not to frost overnight. Um, you know, if it went down to minus one, I figured things would be okay, maybe a little bit marginal, but um, ideally, 
you'd probably want to make sure that, you know, your temperatures are, are in the range of sort of two to five degrees Celsius um, on the positive side. But as I say, it was 2019 was just such a long, slow, cold spring that I got impatient and I knew that, you know, we have such a short growing season anyway, I was kind of pushing the envelope a little bit. Uh, Katja, do you, do you have questions from uh, YouTube side? Yes, uh, Rebecca, you've got a question here from Anne. Um, when to replant geraniums after storing them for the winter in a paper bag in the basement? <laughs> I only tried doing that one time. And um, it was about three years later that I discovered the geraniums in the paper bag. And I can tell you that that was definitely way too late. <laughs> So I, I do what I do with my geraniums is I take the cuttings and I bring them in and I put them, pot them up and I put them on a windowsill. So I have smaller plants and, um, and then I can take additional cuttings about this time of year or, you know, in the next few weeks as the plants start to get leggy. Um, as I say, I have, do not have experience with that, but I would say that um, as the days start to get longer, uh, you can probably start potting up your, your stored geraniums. But right. it's not a technique that worked for me because I, I just forgot about the poor things and they ended up all dying. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, that won't work so well. Okay, uh, another question from Catherine. Uh, any ideas for cheap homemade seedling pots? You know, I reuse them every year. And um, so this is, this is a pot that I've probably reused several times already. It's one of those flimsy ones that you get from the, from the nursery. And what I do is that at the end of the pop-up nursery season, which is you know, usually around the middle of July or so thereabouts, I go around to the Loblaws and the Canadian Tires and I scoop up any pots that they're just going to be sending back. I bring them home, I give them a thorough wash, and then I rinse them in a 10% bleach solution. And that's what I use. So I'm reusing. I know that there are people who've had a lot of luck with the soil blocks. Um, I attended a, a, seeds, a seed starting lecture that was given by the uh, Thousand Island Master Gardeners last week. They were recommending the peat pots. Frankly, I don't like any of those containers. And the reason I don't is that I find that with the bottom watering, the soil blocks just fall apart, the peat pots fall apart. There's no way to label them effectively, except with some silly little stick, which is going to, you know, impede the growth of my seedlings. I'm, this is a case where I'm a fan of plastic, and I'm a fan of reusing. Right. So the key here is to uh, sterilize those containers when you reuse them. Absolutely. Bleach. Okay, great. And, you know, like a 10% bleach solution in water um, and just make sure that they're, you know, they, they soak for a few minutes and that'll do the trick for you. Right. Okay. So we got another question. Tula, aside from the clamshell containers, do you typically sow lots of seeds in one container and then trans them, transplant them into bigger pots? Yes, or or sow into larger pots to avoid having to transplant things? No, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a big believer in survival of the fittest. So I crowd those little puppies in there and whoever survives, that's fine. Um, and then I transplant out into larger containers or straight out into the garden. Great, um, let's see. The other advantage of, of that, just to continue that answer, the other advantage of not using the, um, the larger pots and giving things room to grow um, is that you have more room under your lights so you can start more different varieties of plants too. Mm -hmm. now, there are going to be some exceptions and there are certainly some varieties of plants. Um, for example, bean plants are another one that really doesn't like to be transplanted. And that's one that you like your squash and your zucchini and so forth. You're actually better off waiting until your soil is warmed up 
and seeding them directly outside. Mm -hmm. uh, the, um, the poppies that I mentioned, the annual poppies, that's one that has a very, very fine, delicate taproot. I would never attempt to transplant them. I sow them directly where I want them. Great. Well, here's a really good question. Uh, can leggy seedlings be saved? They absolutely can, yes. Um, in fact, particularly if you're talking about something like a tomato seedling, um, what you would typically do with that little guy is to remove his bottom leaves and plant him. And I'm going to use the coleus as an example. So here's, uh, here's my little, let's imagine this is a tomato seedling. I've picked off the bottom leaves and I'm going to plant him right up to there. So this much of the stem is below ground. And the reason I do that with my tomato seedlings is that little nodes will turn into roots all along this stem and you'll end up with a lovely big healthy root ball. So even with um, varieties of plants that you don't want to plant more deeply, exposing them to a brighter light uh, will help them come back. And that's one of the nice things about both children and seedlings is they have a lot of plasticity. They'll survive a lot of, there's a reason I never became a mother, isn't there? Um, <laughs> they'll survive a lot of abuse. <laughs> Great. Well, that's it for questions right now. If we wanted to wait another minute uh, or Jeff, are, we're uh, gonna wait, let's see. Yeah, that's it for questions, Rebecca. Thank you so much. <laughs> You're very welcome. This was fun. I enjoyed it. And I hope everybody out there is, is thinking about where to get their seeds from and what they're going to be starting. And, you know, even if you're just growing some of those easy annuals, um, last year I had a heck of a time. I couldn't find marigolds for the life of me. They were a terrific companion plant. So even if all you do is you grow a flat of marigolds, and you offer those to the OHS for our sale, you'll find people who are willing to, to buy them, maybe even me. So um, don't feel like there's any plant that's too common. It may be common for you. It may be something that you, know, you think you have way too much of. One of the big values that I've found over the years as an OHS member is that things like, um, you know, the plants that everybody loves to hate in their garden because they have too many of them. Well, somebody like me who is growing on pure beach sand, I love those invasive species. Well, I shouldn't say invasive species. I love those ones that are easy to grow because they will grow in my sandy soil. So um, there's somebody who's going to love your plants, even if you don't particularly enjoy them. Have a great evening, everybody, and happy growing. Thank, Thank you. you, Rebecca. Thank you, everyone.